looks like your numbers are climbing slightly. Um, so Dima, are you going to do kind of like a housekeeping or would you like me to do that? Um, yeah, you can. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So welcome everybody. Uh, it is 3 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Central time, I think. 12 p.m. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, all the time zones, right? Time zone. <laughs> Thank you all um, so much for being here today to uh, partake in this webinar. This webinar is being recorded. And so uh, after it is processed, we will send it out to all of you along with the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I, they have asked uh, that you put your Q&A, your questions in the Q&A box. Um, it just kind of makes it easier to monitor that. Obviously, the chat is great uh, to kind of, you know, throw your two cents in there, kind of help each other out. Um, so that feature is also available. I believe Surema is going to be uh, monitoring that as well as best as she can. Um, so there will be about 100 of you on here. Uh, so just be mindful of that. But other than that, go ahead and take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much. So again, welcome everyone to the technology and data real solutions from TRIO professionals. Today, we have our awesome speaker, Mr. Aaron Cortez. Um, he serves as the Director of STEAM Pathways at the Center for College Access and Success of Northeastern Illinois University. In this capacity, he directs the TRIO Upward Bound, TRIO Upward Bound Math and Science, and the 21st Century Community of Learning Centers. Mr. Cortez is also a Computer Science Department Adjunct Professor. Mr. Cortez is an advocate of promoting STEM and STEAM education, international access, and college readiness for low-income, first-generation, college-bound, and college-enrolled students. Due to his engagement, he has been a two-term president of the Illinois TRIO Association, the immediate past president of the Midwestern Educational Opportunity Association, and a board member of the Council for Opportunity in Education, COE. In addition, Mr. Cortez has had engaged in collaborative work with the U.S. Department of Agri Agriculture as the Kika del Garza Fellowship, Khan Academy Ambassador, Chicago STEM Pathways Cooperative, the Asian Pacific Economic Op Cooperation as STEAM Specialist, Organization of American States, the Pan American Development Foundation, and most recently the Fellow of Northwestern University Center for Excellence in Computer Science Education. So with that, I welcome Mr. Cortez and thank you so much for leading this session for us today. Thank you so much, Sarima. And I apologize for that long bio. I thought <laughs> I cut it off last time, but I guess it just didn't. And, and so once again, thank you very much. Um, so um, I think we, we, um, we got through this, right? So I work at Northeastern University in Chicago, um, been doing some uh, work with TRIO programs since 2003. Um, I was a tutor at the time, and then I became a director, and then we got a couple more grants, and so now I'm, I'm lucky to be part of the leadership at the university. Um, so, you know, today we're going to talk about a few things, right? We're going to talk about data and how data could help us understand how to better serve our students, right? Now in the days of all this technology and all this different, you know, systems that we could have in place. Now, um, before we get started and I give you like kind of like how we're going to go through um, in, in the session goals, um, I think, you know, it's very important to see that, you know, when we look at data, right, we need to change that data into information and that information into how we approach an improvement on our services, right? What is ha not happening, right? So quick example, if I have a tendon sheet, what is that a tendon sheet does? Does that only just says for the sake of tracking attendance or are we using it to see hey, in this activity, we have very little engagement because we have low attendance rates, right? What does that tell me of the activity at the part of people or to participants showing up, right? Uh, whoever we are serving. So I think it's very important to look at this. Um, Carly Fiorani is from the Hewlett Parker, Parker, Packard um, organization. And so she's always looking at technology as a way to get gather data, right? And when you're gathering data, what does that data do? Now, in the age of all your data being collected, right, I think in education, we need to be mindful as well, right? Mindful of like, if we have all the systems in place, what can we do to benefit from this data gathering? And from the sense of a TRIO professional and a TRIO program. So uh, session goals, right? Why data is relevant for TRIO programs, right? How is this connected? Why are we doing all this work? 
Um, then we're going to talk about like how to do how we do this plan and development of data tools. And I'm going to go through a number of data tools, all of them free, um, so that you could see it. Now I'm not going to touch in specific software systems, so I'm not going to talk about how we use Empower or how um, other trip programs use Student Success or you know Blue Man. I'm not going to go into those because those are their own data collection systems, right? Um, I am going to really talk more about like how you use data in all these different sectors uh, of technology tools to make informed decisions of how you improve right, your programming with the thought that you need to evaluate every single thing that you're doing and implementing in the program. Because I think, again, not only is about using a tool, but also assessing if that tool is relevant to the work that you do and how could that help you increase um, your impact in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the students that you serve, participants that you provide services. Now, I will also say that I do not like to do work for the sake of doing the work, right? I need to find out ways to make it much more impactful. Um, and not that we're not making it impactful, but there is points where I no longer say, let's just check the box, right? It's more about like, why are we checking the box? Is this the best way of checking the box off, right? What are we doing to do all this, all this procedure, right? So um, one of the things that we are going to also kind of look a little bit and, you know, you will get the presentation. So you don't have to rush through this and, and write any of this part. But, you know, if you want to, you could actually just QR code that QR code with your phone. But as we look and assessing each one of those tools or even where you are currently about your data gathering, gathering tools, it is important that you look at this smart goals, right? And so that's why we're putting this template in because I think it, it matters to know, you know, each one of these elements, right? Is it specific to what you wanna do, right? How do you accomplish gathering this data, right? Um, is it measurable? Is the tool measurable? Are you measuring what you need to do for your program to be successful, right? And so those are two things. You're assessing the tool, but how that tool is useful to the work that you're doing with programs. And then are you gonna make this you know, process achievable, right? It's important to know that when you use a technology tool that you don't spend all this funds and time and effort into something that you are not gonna use in six months, right? It is really about developing the capacity of your staff and your team to learn how to use these tools, but only if they're useful for the program. Technology tools should allow you to reduce time that you spend doing this process, right? They're supposed to maximize your output, right? With the, and minimize the amount of time that you spend on doing this work. Um, does it, is it relevant, right? How relevant is this to the work that you do? Or is it just one more technology tool that you're bringing to the program? And how long does it gonna take to either establish this, review this, or really implement it, right? You have to kind of see those things in, in, in those different aspects. Um, so again, that, that link will lead you to a template. You could download it and use it as you want. So data and analytics, right? What data do we collect, right? And these are some examples of data that we're gonna be talking about co uh, collecting, right? Data that we could actually use some tools to collect, right? And for what purpose? Now, all of this are aligned to objectives, right? They all should be aligned to your objectives. It should be just like, I'm collecting data for the sake of collecting data. It should be about, if I'm talking about retention, Attendance is important, but also the profile of the student and the academic level of the student. So I need to track a number of items to make sure that we meet those objectives, especially if you're looking at it at the pre-college, but even in the college level, right? What are your objectives? And out of those objectives, what is the data that I need to get? And that's how we connect it, right? That's how we say, this is the right tool for that, right? So you know, looking at attendance, the participant profiles, do you have one? Does your tool allow you to have that? And what does that profile actually inform you of, right? If somebody logs in and looks at participant profile, what is the information that you're getting and how's that information helping meet your grant goals and you know your and completing your annual performance report, right? To meet those goals, you need to have certain data, right? And so some of this might not be as necessary as other things, right? And so maybe you do need to continue to have a, a specific GPA for your students, um, you need to make sure that they, they enroll into post-secondary or they graduate from post-secondary education, right? Those items are important and relevant. Where do you find that information? And then how do you also connect the part that is not about just gathering the data, but also how do you make sure that your information, it is 
received and it is used, right? That's a big one. We don't know if our participants are using our, our, our systems or not, right? Unless they're logged in at the same time that we are, we might not know. How do we also collect that data, right? What are the time periods where participants or whoever we serve is involved, right? If, if people are more likely to be engage with us during a certain period of time, why do we offer other times? Why don't we just stick to that time? Because again, it is about time and effort, right? And capacity, right? So do making, are, are we using our data and the analytics of that data to come up with a solution, right? And a solution that allows for participants to be better engaged. And at the end of it all, all this, you still need to evaluate if these tools and the data that you're collecting is relevant to what you do. Even though you might think it is, Eventually, you might end up to a point where like that data might not be what you're looking for. So what are we going to look in terms of technology? Because it's data, but for data, you need technology, right? You need, you need a tool to gather that data, right? And you know, I think we are past the time where we are having everything on paper. So like nobody has like this really long printouts with all the attendance sheets and we're counting with a calculator how many dates has a person come in, right? Or, you know. We're not, we're not in that place anymore. We're in a place where technology is supposed to help us, right? We utilize that tool. So we're going to talk about like current technology software, right? Things that you're already having campus. You don't need to ad additionally add or purchase or any of that. And then some piloting of technology systems that might be used that, that might be useful. How do we assess that new technology, right? It will give you a little bit of a highlight of how in our programs we've been assessing the engagement of individuals, participants with the technology that we're implementing. And the end, it's just the release of that new implementation, right? Like once you assess and release and pilot, how do you move forward and say, okay, now, instead of just doing it with this 10 students, we're gonna do it with a hundred students, right? We need to make sure that we don't just deploy for the sake of doing another tool that you pilot, right? That you test, it's a beta test in some way, right? I'm not talking about technology. It's testing that this uh, new approach will be helpful. So again, now with that in, in, in mind, right, with all those concepts, right, let's move on to what is the meat of it, right? Like, what can we use to make this happen? So, you know, you could so easily as do an Excel. Now, I am going to give you a little backstory. It wasn't until two, one year and a half ago that we moved from doing everything on Excel sheets for our data gathering to a uh, management system, right? So it's just been two years since we moved into Empower, and we're still using it, but our spreadsheets have become a part of what we do, right? It, they're easy to manage. Everyone has access to that. So it's easy to share when we need to share. Um, it, we can manage them um, in terms of access. That has been our core. Now, we also, you know, earlier on, started using a lot of the Google services because we knew that we were able to do a lot of work in the cloud. And that way I didn't have a spreadsheet one, a spreadsheet two, a spreadsheet 30. And then we didn't know which spreadsheet was the one that we need to work on, right? We have moved so far away from passing around each other's USBs, right? I mean, you, we might still have some USBs here and there, but you know, we're not like, that's the USB that has all of the data for the program, right? It's mainly now manage or save or store in the working cloud, right? To work it and to update it and to improve it, it turns to be on the cloud. So that's why I'm going to focus on the Google Sheets, right? For attendance and the profiling and all that part. So those of you that do not have a system in place, you could say, oh, I could do this. Now a system will give you a lot more, uh, a management system will give you a lot more tools, right? Uh, tools that are a little more user-friendly than learning, you know, um, learning certain formulas. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that most of your computers will have Excel. Most of your computers will have numbers, which is if you have an Apple, you just come and install, right? If you have a, a, a computer from work, it most likely has a Microsoft Office because a lot of campuses have Microsoft as like a standard to all of their equipment, right? And then if you don't have any of those, then you just create a Google uh, account. You know, maybe you already have a Google account with your, your institution and you create a Google Sheet and make sure that you have the right processes in place for the data to be stored correctly so that it, you don't end up having a data bridge, which means, you know, having information that is um, that that might break into the FARPA or, or any or, or HEPA um, regulation. So again, we'll talk a little bit about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually click on this. So when you get it, you'll be able to just go to this. Um, so I am going to go to this um, Google sheet. So just if you give me a second, I'm going to escape from here and I'm gonna to go to this one. So 
I am going to double click here. And so right now what you're seeing and tell me in the chat box if you're seeing, you're seeing a Google uh, a spreadsheet, correct? You're seeing a spreadsheet on the screen. That's what I'm sharing. Excellent. So this spreadsheet is very simple, right? And I have actually created a template. So you should be able to actually use this template as well if you wanted to, right? So very simple stuff, right? Um, information of the student we have here, you know, we track them with social security numbers. That's just no longer the use, right? Like now we have code, so we have that. Um, you know, we have groups because, you know, we break them into specific groups that the students participate. And then if they're accepted in the program or not. And this is just the attendance sheet part of it, right? And so you'll see that we have each one of these what could be either a P or an A. And at the end of it all, at the end of the day, we have all these numbers that allow us to do configurations on a collection, right? So if I have present in all of these rows or all these columns, then it will add it automatically, right? And so that way I could actually say, oh, this student has come this many times out of a, a total percentage, what is it, right? And so I could actually have a better tracking of it. Now, because it's a Google sheet, we're able to do the per like in-person attendance, right? Because, you know, sometimes our cake systems don't go away. So, you know, we still are asked, oh, by daughters, where are your attendance sheets, right? And so in order not to have an issue with an audit, you still collect attendance sheets. But all those attendance sheets, the data really gets dropped into a spreadsheet, right? Again, that if, if, if I was the one deciding, we will no longer do that and everything gets just attendance sheets out of an iPad or a phone or a computer and we're done. But again, auditing, companies and organizations tend to be very much about hard, hard copies, right? So just in case we we keep our files, we put it away, we scan them and we never see them again after they have been completed. So our attendance sheet just becomes, the paper copy becomes just the information that we drop here. So that will give you like also attendance per day, attendance per the whole entire program, right? So that way you start looking at those specifics of how to do this. Now, in the presentation, I also give you links for formulas, right? You shouldn't be memorizing formulas. I mean, some of us do, right? But you shouldn't be worried about like, what is the formula for counting if something is a specific letter, right? Like you don't need to bother with that. You just need to just find the link that tells you what, how that code is. And you just grab that formula and you drop it into where you need to drop it. And that's about it. Um, drop down menus as well. You will see that, you know, for some of these, um, this one doesn't have it, but there's others that I do that we do have, there will be a drop down menu with the PNNA &A or uh, e, an X for excuse or something like that, or a holiday, right? So very simple data gathering tool, but it just gives you enough information for you to be able to pull, right? And then I could say, well, uh, student one, right? Has been coming this many days and the average per day is this much. And so that is some data that usually we do to, we do, we used to bring to our partner schools. So this will be like something that either, let's say you're a pre-college program. I will gather the data of participants that have been coming from that school. And I provide that short, small report to the school saying, Hey, we have in, there's in this school, school A, we have 80% attendance. This is the number of students total that I come in. This is our average attendance every single week. Um, they've been coming for this many weeks. It's good to provide that information. And I'm going to talk about newsletters to use for that infographic to actually share that kind of information as well. Because data is not only about collecting, it's always about also how you show it, right? That's why we have an annual performance report. So again, that is that will be the, the site that sends that information, right? But it starts with something as simple as spreadsheet. Now, I also have a tab right here that's called student information, right? And so the student information is a little bit more detailed, right? It will tell us like some of our students are part of certain projects, right? Like they might be doing a specific type of research, right? So we categorize it by the research or the project or the activity they're part of. If they're in a, a, a research team every Saturday, that, that's the research team Saturday. And that gives me some idea also how to uh, allocate the resources, also understand where do we may have gaps, right? So if I'm seeing that a lot of people are not coming to a tutoring session and I have 80, 80 students that are doing tutoring, but they're not coming, then maybe we need to revise what tutoring looks like, right? So we need to make sure that we, we keep an eye on that, um, on that service, right? Based on data. And so again, it is about those numbers letting us how to deal with that. But this you'll see like there's a number of areas that I could actually have here. Um, and manage with, you know, when they come, where the percent, um, how many days to have them in their serve. And again, this is out of data that is needed to um, be um, 
collected for a state grant. So it really is just a template and you could just change around whatever, you know, whatever of this, um, the nominations you want, right? Um, and so that's a very good one. And then your school report's a little more simple. Um, you could actually just play around with this, but the school report will say like, student is on this GPA or it's moving in a different GPA, or I just saw it that from one quarter to the next quarter, they dropped. And this could be anywhere from pre-college all the way to graduate school, right? Because you could track that, 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 that change, right? Um, especially those schools that actually offer universities that offer midterm, you know, grades or update grades throughout the semester, you could actually have some of that because knowing where they are at a specific point in time, even if they are in, in middle school or all the way into college, it will allow you to actually define the services and the support systems that you need to offer. So again, that is a, a very simple spreadsheet. From here, you could download into spreadsheet or download into numbers and still works the same, right? As long as you have those, um, those data sets. So again, I am gonna jump back in here and go to the present view so you can see it in a bigger uh, a size. But those are two spreadsheet uh, Excel Excel cheat sheets that you could use with all the details, right? Like it'll tell you how to do count this, how to count that, how to get a percentages. All your data should be very simple to read, right? So if you have a tutor that's doing attendance, they should be able to say like, oh, 80%, that 80% out of 15 sessions, right? What does that even mean, right? Oh, there's a number. That means that they came, you know, 12 times out of the 15 times that we were. And that gives me an 80 something percent, right? I'm just making, you know, averages right here, right? Like not exact numbers, but that is something that is very useful. Um, and again, you'll have it for the, the Google Sheets. You also will have it for numbers. So if you have a Mac, just use numbers. There's no need to, to go into another system. You could just have it within that system. Um, now, that part is about collecting data, right? Student data, um, information that you might get from the school, information you might get from the activities that you're working with students, maybe your student profile, you could actually manage it right into a spreadsheet, right? But then a second part of it is how do we track if any of our information is really being observed, right? Is it really being accessed? And this is this might go also more into the college, but you know, how many times have we have sent or shared something with our participants, right? Or EOC for that matter. And we don't know if they got it or not. We don't know if they're looking at it or not, right? So having a, a system that allows to track your communication is very important. And one of those systems that we use is called Rebrandly. And Rebrandly is a free tool that does, not only does it do a short link, but it tracks how many times that link gets clicked, right? So if I wanna know, if I create a, 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 a enrollment form, right? And I want to make sure that, you know, that enrollment form is used. Yes, that enrollment form will be clicked when it's completed, but I want to see people are even seeing it, right? So some people might see it and they're not completed, but I really want to know the reach of that. And this is data, right? Because depending on how that information that you're sharing is how you are going to know if it's useful or not. So hopefully that makes sense. So for example, if you're sending um, uh, students that are freshmen, in high school or middle school and high school, and you send them a link about, I mean, information about filling out financial aid. And you don't know, they're not, a, they're not a signing up for the activity, right? Well, they might not be signing up because that might not be relevant to them, right? But we don't know if they're actually clicking on, on that communication or not. So by adding this like specific trackable links, I could see where it's coming. So I'm going to skip again, and I'm going to show you what uh, Rebrandly looks like in in the back end, right? So this will be once you manage it, right? Now I'm able to, I do very much like to do single signings. It means that I use the same account for multiple tools and that the, all those tools kind of connect with each other. So again, because I, I we use a Google domain for our pre-college programs that rebrandly fits very well into it because I could sign in with the same account and I'm able to transfer some data correctly. But I'm gonna look at this um, strategic plan survey 21, right? So I'm gonna just click on it. Um, and so when I click on it, you'll see that I get this type of data, right? And so again, we're talking about data, right? And so, you know, it shows, you know, this one might not matter much if you're just doing um, local. If you're doing international work, like some of us do, you might wanna see where it's going, right? Like where are the places that are getting some clicks? But here definitely I could tell that, okay, well, you know, on, um, on that date, which was the 20th of, of April, we got two clicks, but on 
the 26th of April, we have four clicks. So this is sometimes when we look at an analytics and we say, when is the best time or day for us to share information? When is this link most likely to be clicked on or worked on, right? And so we could even go to the hours and, you know, uh, uh, or months, right? Which months we have the most. So in March, we have the most clicks. In April, we had less link, uh, clicks. This was sent on March 16. So it makes sense that in March, we had the most, right? Um, and then you could look at a few more other areas, like when in the dates, what was the days that was the most engagement, right? And again, this is data, right? Like this is assessing data, understanding that I'm not gonna send anything on Friday. Why would I send any information to people on Friday when they're not gonna check it, right? So then in Friday, right? If you send it at 9 a.m. in the morning, it's buried. And when they get to Monday, it's underneath all these other me messages, right? All this other information, all these other assignments, all these other communications. It takes hours to get through emails, right? And so you don't want your information to be buried. So again, it looks like Tuesday was a perfect day for us to send this. So what we're gonna do is every time we want some engagement with students in this uh, strategic plan um, mm -mm, communication, we just send it on Tuesdays, right? And I use this for other things, not just for students. Um, we could also see what kind of platform the students are using. So if I see that most of them are doing Chrome, then it's good because it allows me to know what kind of systems I could use with the students, right? Or with the participants or even with staff for that matter, right? If I have a plugin or an extension that is only able to be used in Google Chrome, then, you know, this is a good way to know that, right? Instead of like just going back and forth and people saying like, I can't use it, it doesn't work. It also gets me a little bit more detail on which kind of platform it gets used. Um, most people are using desktops and so forth. So that gives you a little bit of it. It allows you to refresh. This whole thing is free at this, at this level, right? Now, the other thing is if I highlight it, you will see that I am able to just test it out. I'm able to copy it. I'm able to share it, right? I'm able to edit that. I could get rid of it. Um, but when I go to copy, right, when I, um, when I create this, it also allows me to do a, um, a QR code. So if I go to share, I could even share it as a social media directly into an email, or which is really cool for those of you that have programs that do flyers, you could actually just request a QR code ex directly from here. Now, two things, right? If someone doesn't know how to use a QR code, by making short links, you all, you remove the factor of people having issues typing in this really long link, right? You should never share a link that is really long. It should always be a few words, right? So as you can see, none of this are really long code, right? Code Clark, that's it. Uh, Trio UVMS app 2021. Um, there's nothing that is like a super long sentence, right? Because again, one character wrong allows for that person not to get access to it. And you all know it. Once you type something wrong, you just don't care. You just move on, right? And it's not that you don't care. It's just that it might be frustrating, right? So you might lose some participants that way. So again, rebrandly is a great tool for, 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 no, for understanding where your data is going and what are the best times for communication to go out to students, participants, or even partners. Let me go back to... The presentation and go to the next one. Um, the next one is a Google form, very simple Google form. But I think the part that is very important on this Google forms is all of the um, additional form notifications that you could add. Now, this might not so much about just data gathering because you create a form and you could gather data that way, right? It goes into a spreadsheet. You could connect that spreadsheet into your other spreadsheet by linking, right? So that's also a good thing. You could link in your applications that directly drop all the information to your attendance if you wanted to, right? So you could actually do this into an attendance, not a not a, a job application, but it could be an attendance list and students click on their names, right? Um, you could actually have them to log in with their account. So that way it's certified that they actually use their account. So it's not another person. So if you were to be asked, um, when, uh, how do you move around uh, the, the class, right? I mean, sorry. So if you were to ask by an auditor, how do I know that this is the right student? Well, they logged in with their account, right? With their actual school account or, or their program account. So unless somebody else is, you know, logging in with their credentials, then this might not be the student, right? So again, just looking at those parts that are important. So that's how you could actually collect some data. But for your end, 
being able to actually send out some notifications on completion and notifications for your staff to know that data has been inputted, it's very relevant. And some forms don't allow you to do that. So again, this is a really good tool. I'm just gonna go quickly into um, the form itself. Um, you're seeing the back end, right? But you could actually add a number of things here. You know, this is an application for our staff. So we align it with the school, with the university, we have all the information. But again, here is the most important thing, right? Adding those um, additional notifications or plugins or extensions to the form to get data out, right? To get data to you. Because at the end of it all, it's knowing that the data has been submitted. So if I was to go here, I'm not gonna click on the responses because you're gonna see people's uh, personal information, but I will be able to actually know that my staff and my team know that someone applied for the job, right? And then we could follow up with it um, instead of just like a random email. It will give me a notification. It will just make it much more cleaner. So again, that is um, a one way to collect data, right? You could put into the data, into the form, the data that you wanna collect from the participants, all of our registrations are now forms. Now that's not the formal application because again, some auditors and at least our university auditors are always asking for paper copies all the time. Like if it's not in, in blood written by their parents, the signature signing off, it's like a big deal. It's like, we, we're not in compliance. So that's fine, right? So we have, a, 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 we have an, an interest form that this, the, the participants and the parents fill out saying that they're interested on the program, especially for the pre-college, right? They're interested in the program. They filled out this information that go, directly goes to a Google spreadsheet, which is created out of that form itself. And then from there, we just link all the data. And it makes it very simple to gather the data and manage the data. Now, we also use this for assessments. So again, data gathering, right? If we wanted to do an assessment, right, for staff, right, for staff, um, I mean, for staff, right? You could do an assessment for staff on their, their, their capacities on a specific project or activity. You could actually ask all these questions. We have a computer science um, uh, form that we created for our students to know where they were at the beginning of our computer science project, right? And so now we are getting data that like tells us not only attitude, which is used for research, right? Their attitude towards, their perception towards science, and also their knowledge, right? Academic knowledge. Do they understand what is a for loop, right? Do they understand like a specific concept? Like it could be, do they know what an algebraic equation it looks like, right? Can they solve one? So those assessments to us are very simple managing them through a form because then we could duplicate that or, or, or make multiple copies of it and send it to different groups of students or a different group of participants. Um, so again, I think that is, um, that is something that it's, uh, that it's it, it could be of, of need. Um, I apologize, let me go to the next section. And so another way to do this is by polling, right? Uh, and so one of the things that um, we have used is both of this, um, it's been Poll Everywhere and Mentimeter. Now we use Poll Everywhere because it's connected to a, our Google account, right? Um, but Mentimeter is something that we use because of the actual ability to do a lot more information and even downloading all the results, uh, results right? Um, it breaks it down much better in much neater way. This will be the only one that I would say, suggest that you don't use the, the free version, that you actually go ahead and use the um, other version. Um, and that version being the, um, that, that, the paid version of Mentimeter is well worth it, right? And I apologize for that. I'm just, my, my phone just keeps on blowing up uh, for programming <laughs> during sessions. So uh, the Mentimeter, um, I think it's the best tool. I think it's less than $100 a month, I mean, a year. So it's really good. And so, but you could also do what I did first, right? On the piloting, they only allow you to like three questions per, per poll. So I'll do three questions on one and then I'll ask everybody to jump into the next link three more questions, and then I jump into the link, and then three more questions, that made it nine questions total, right? I might not even care to do that much. I, I did some short um, uh, polling on just two or three questions within the system. So again, I am going to just go to it and show you the, the, the actual screen of it, right? And so this is the, the good thing. You could reset the, you could download and reset all the results, and you start all over again right? Or you could just duplicate this, this presentation, but it allows you to do quite a few things, which I think sometimes are very important. Um, it allows you to just 
be able to like submit some 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 information in it. So if you wanted to get that gather data of what the students um, perceive or know of being a bi marine biologist or a journalist, right? So they could actually, you know, give you like blocks, right? Something like this, right? Like where they give you blocks of information, right? And so this was a, a session that we used for a mentoring program with Deloitte. Um, and so we just ask, right? Like, what is it? What is important to, to do mentoring for you? But this could be like, what do you think about um, about um, um, journalism, right? Like what, what do you think that profession is about, right? So if you wanted to do something in that end, you could use this and all that data, right? Gets gathered, gets pulled. And now you know the participants that are submitting this, right? Um, you could really make sure that you got all the data and then it works out pretty well. So again, Mentimeter, I think it's a very, very good tool. Um, it makes it very easy for us to, to collect, right? Um, poll everywhere is very similar. I am just gonna go to it. Um, I don't know why. Why well, call uh, click, but there is poll everywhere. I'm just gonna quickly log in with my account. I apologize for the delay, but I'm just showing you that that's how it works. So you'll see that this is the way it looks like. Um, we have it embedded into our Google Sheets, which is also another good thing. Our present, I mean, our Google Slides, which is our presentations. So I'm able to just create it in here or create it within the Google Slide. So if I go to this Google Slide and I go ahead and I say, um let's duplicate the slide right and then i could actually just delete this whole thing right remove this and just dump here a um an add-on so i could go ahead and just drop in here from the add-ons a document a diagram or some other stuff but i could drop down here a poll everywhere um sessions right into the presentation and collect it within the presentation as well so that also makes it that you're not jumping from one side to the other side. It just makes it all into one system. Sometimes this is really good if you're doing a session with participants, right? You want everything in just that same slide, you just move through and then the data is just feeding into it. Um, you could also do the same thing with Mentimeter. It just takes a little bit of, of, of tweaking, um, but you could actually do that kind of work within it. Um, time is it? 2.37, okay. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm not rushing through it because uh, sometimes I do rush, uh, I do have too much into the presentations. Um, so this is the next one. So another way to collect data, right? So when it comes to communication, and so this is a newsletter. And remember when I told you like, how do you disseminate your information of your program? How you disseminate com communication to know are students applying or participants applying? Are they knowing of your activities? How do they engage in those activities, right? All of that is very important to know um, and to, to, to be able to manage that, um, sometimes you need to figure out a way to approach it, right? And so I am here on MailChimp and MailChimp is free if you have a Google account as well, right? And again, I do not work for Google. It's just, it so happens that it, this has been very useful to us, right? Um, so again, I think that is something that um, it's very useful and I'm gonna go through it quickly of what this looks like, right? Um, so just give me one second while I go ahead and move screens. Maybe. So go ahead. So um, this is the campaign. So now I'm going to shift you completely away from education because newsletters, right, especially this type of system, MailChimp system, it's really for marketing purposes. So again, I think as a true director, um, or, or, or someone that works within a true program, you're really an entrepreneur. That's how I've always seen it, right? You have to figure out ways to make your program successful, sometimes with little to no support from the institution or the organization. That's sometimes the case. Now, I'm not saying that the institutions are not welcoming. I'm just saying sometimes that's the case, right? So when that happens, you're not only um, the one that is managing all the academic content, you're also marketing, uh, managing all of your design and media, right? And your marketing and your hiring and all those sorts of things, right? So one of the things that has been very useful for us is creating these campaigns through MailChimp. And what happens is each one of these campaigns not only allows us to have a template to work on these campaigns, but also it allows us to track every single item that is inside of those templates or inside of those newsletters. Now, we have moved away from doing like um, campaigns or newsletters 
that are like done on Word or done on you know publisher because one they are attachments two they might not land on people because they might be too large and then if they're so big are people really reading it, right? And how do you even know? Because when you send the attachment, you don't know if people are seeing it or not, right? You're just sending it out, right? And so again, how do we make sure that, that people get engaged? So one of the things that I did first to find out about data, right, and, and analytics was, what does companies do? In this case, like Coca-Cola, right? Let's just grab that. Like, what does Coca-Cola do? Or, or a, a, a store, um, shopping store, right? They send you these newsletters with all these links, they're tracking every single activity. Why can't we think about that into the individuals that we serve, right? So how do we track their engagement, their participation, their interest, right? Because if I send a newsletter that no one's looking at, then what's the point, right? And so again, there is work that shouldn't be done just for the sake of it. You need to find out how to do this, right? And so one of those things is doing this. So I'm just going to go quickly and look at a a, let's use this one. It's a college access and success award night. And this is all a drop down menu type of uh, um, document, right? So this is the campaign. This is the way you show. If I click on and view in your view in your browser that it is, right? And so this is an invitation that we send out. People could click on that. And so not only when people open this link, we will get a hit saying a person opened this. We will also be able to get a link, a, a hint, a hit on data if they were to click on the RSVP. Now, as a side note, nothing to do with, with data, but really about user interaction. If you see at the corner, it says translate. So if a person gets this, right, I, they could actually go ahead and say, well, you know, I just don't know my Spanish well enough. I mean, my English well enough. So I am gonna go ahead and look at um, Hongo, Korean. Right, and you will translate it directly from Google Chrome, right? And so, um, should have translated. What did it do? Give me a second. And this just made me a liar. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, it should have worked. All right, there you go. See, I wasn't lying. Um, so this uh, automatically do it. I did not pay additional cost to this, and I know many of us you know, have the, the need to translate our documents, especially when, you know, we're talking about reaching out to the families, right? Um, how do we make sure that they understand what it is? Now, again, this is a, 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 an automated translation, but the reality is that at least it gives you the content, right? And the concept and the idea where you're trying to share, right? So it's not just like, oh, it's random letters that don't mean anything. If you read Hangul, you'll be able to understand this. So I am going to go ahead into a language that I'm a little bit more um, comfortable with. So I'm going to go with Spanish, right? And translation is going. Um, so, you know, it reads pretty well. Uh, uno sea nosotros en nuestra oficina del centro de NIU para una noche de alegría y excelencia. That sounds pretty good, right? So again, if you don't have the capacity to hire a translator, then this is a good thing, right? So anyway, that is just something that is a sign note that I think it's great that you could use. It's not about data, but it is about using things that collect data that also engage in other parts, right? Like, so this tool not only creates the creates a newsletter for us to share out, but it also gives us data of what things are. So I'm going to click on view report. And now what you're seeing is the performance of this campaign, right? And so the opening rate, what is the open rate? Like 45.8%. What is the click rate? So if I click on click rate, what is the, the, the click rate on, a, on this campaign, right? Um, how many of those were unsubscribed, meaning that people that were not in our list, that somebody forwarded them that, this to, right? It doesn't get tracked, it does get tracked, right? So when I say it doesn't get tracked is because you're not sending to an individual that you have in your list of dissemination, right? And so it is not tracked initially, it's tracked afterwards. So again, this is just the open rate. It gives you a little bit of information. Um, you're at, and, and this also is good because it allows you to compare it to other campaigns that you might have shared. Um, and this is the peers, right? This is comparing you to the market, right? And so what is the percentage of usually, you know, other educational organizations that are sending this, right? Like, so COE, right? When they send a newsletter, you get all this data, not the same in the same format, 
but it's a similar format. So we are able to, COE is able to say, okay, our newsletter is being read, our newsletter is being clicked. So for the book club that they're having for the summer, right? How many people are actually clicking on it, but not registering, right? That is a good thing to know, right? When are people really looking at this is very important. Um, then it just goes through the performance. And I think one of the best thing is if you have people that have been assigned with emails, it will tell you who opened it the most. So for example, if you're working with the institution, this is a newsletter that you're sending to students, but you also included a few faculty, right? Because maybe you're in the research on McNair. Well, if I see that one of the professors in the McNair research team is actually clicking a bunch of times, that's a good thing. That means that they're getting and looking at this information, right? They might be even sharing it with others. So again, this is a good way to like do analytics on the data. This is collecting the data without you inputting anything, right? It's just automated by the person opening up the system. So again, it is, it, again, it's not student data, but it's data on how your communication is being accepted and it's being managed, which is important to make decisions, right? When do I send this? When, don't I, when should I not be sending this stuff, right? And again, this is all just data. I give you some information. You could download the whole entire thing. Um, you could look at your performance on the clicks. Um, you know, we got three target clicks, two unique clicks. You know, that's just for the registration. Um, if you have social impact, we don't have it connected. But if you have your social campaign, like, you know, Facebook or, or Instagram, you could connect it here. And it will also give you information about that. Um, it's just who you send it to. I mean, this is just way too robust for a free program, right? And you can see there, um, and you know, it just gives me all the people that are, have been sent this campaign and you know, their rating, the more stars means that they're more engaged, the less stars, the less engaged they are, right? And so if you send this to students, you'll be able to get quite a bit of information on are they opening, are they looking at it, are they not, right? And so again, this tool is completely free. It gets you up to like, I think a thousand participants, you know, and I don't, unless you're a talent search or EOC, you're not serving more than a thousand, right? Um, and you might need to look at this as like break it down. And so maybe you have two accounts, you know, one for talent search one, talent search two, right? So you could cover your 2000 participants or something like that, right? Um, and again, this is also used in different scenarios, right? We have a a campaign for students, we have a campaign for partners, and we have an institutional campaign. Each one of those gives us different data to collect. And again, I understand this is not student data. This is not how to collect data on a student's social security number, right? Which, you know, that's a whole different story, but it's still giving us data of when will be most impactful for us to engage. Are we disseminating that information and are people seeing it and reading it versus just hoping that somebody saw it and when you bump into them they'll tell you that they read that article right i how do i know that all the work that's been going to put together a newsletter is being utilized correctly so even if it's not really high numbers and high percentages it's fine at least it gives you some information so i think that's where we're coming from in the sense of those new, new newsletters um, let me go back here and then the last one that we are going to talk about in terms of data gathering, and again, this is engagement, because I think this is the thing that I've been hearing from many TRIO professionals. Engagement. How are we engaging students? Students are not showing up to our Saturday program. Students are not coming to tutoring. Students are not coming to counseling. Well, you need to go where they are, right? And if they're spending 80% of their time on TikTok, then as much as I don't care to be in that platform, you just need to go where they are, right? It's That's just the game, right? That's just what it is. Um, and so one of the things that's very important to look at is that Facebook and Instagram, because it's owned by Facebook now, they're integrated, right? And so if you have a strategy, you could actually look at how your post, your information being shared is being looked at. Now, again, this is not student data level, student da uh, level data, but it's still engagement data, right? And so how do we look at the analytics on social media. So I'm just gonna jump in again to our portal. So you should all be seeing our Upper Bamatan Science um, so, uh, uh, Facebook homepage. Um, and this is the management one, right? So like I could actually post here. You'll see there all of the ones that we manage, right? It's quite a bit. Um, and so what I am gonna do is look at this business suite. And when I click on that, it will convert me and take me out to another place. 
And this is a place where it actually gives me all the analytics for the work that we do, right? The analytics on um, how many people are engaging, how many people are clicking here and there. Um, is a post that you gave about scholarships, is it being looked at or nobody paid attention to it, right? Um, is your post so wordy that that's why people are not engaging? Uh, do you need to go into video, right? So there's a number of people I know that are doing amazing work on Instagram, right? Um, or TikTok for that matter, right? And TikTok has its own system to like, you know, assess also some data, some followers. And sometimes it's not even about liking. It's just the fact that somebody sees it on their timeline, right? That is what we want to know. Did it pop out and did it take enough time for people to see it? They didn't like it. They didn't talk about it. They didn't engage with it. That's fine. But because they stayed, because they stayed, guess what? Foot traffic, right? It's like going shop, window shopping, right? You didn't buy anything, but you walk right in front of the store. And so you stop. They're probably going to be like, oh, you really like that outfit. Maybe we need to put in a sale and not really do a sale. We're just going to increase the cost and then put it back to the cost it was by giving you a 20% uh, preferred customer, right? Using those, as unfortunate as it might sound that we are pushing education, you might need to do that especially because nowadays it's all about instant gratification. How quickly can I be gratified by, the, by, by my engagement, right? How soon do my pupils dilate from excitement, right? And so if we look at it that way, this is a great way to look at things, right? Looking at the analytics of it. So I'm just going to go ahead and look at this one. Um, 129 people reached, 10 likes, zero comments. It's unfortunate, but that's just what it is. So I'm going to click on it. And this is the message that we put into Instagram, right? And so I can manage posts. I'm just going to click this. Um, but it gives me some information here, right? It gives me that 10 people liked it. There was 129 people reached. Again, that is when they stayed in their, within their feed, right? They just stay there. So 120 people actually saw it, right? They didn't engage, but they saw it overall, right? Before they scrolled up, before they skipped you, right? And so that gives me some data, at least to start working. Um, I could go to all the insights and the trends, but, you know, if I look at audience, right, I could actually definitely go in here and now you have much more robust data, right? Um, we have, you know, in Facebook, we have 118 reactions, you know, the, of the reach and 140 for the reach on Instagram. Again, it's, it, it's on, their, on their news feed, but they did not interact with it, right? And then it's even better because we have an assumption of who's looking at our data, right? We assume that a specific demographic is looking at it, is that really the demographic, right? So in Instagram, I really thought we were going to have a lot more 13, um, 18 to 24, right? Um, but that's not really the data is showing me, right? I mean, it seems like a lot more are in Instagram, I mean, in Facebook that there are in Instagram, even though all data suggests that that age group is no longer using Facebook. But in our demographic, in our people, the, the communities we serve, a lot more people are involved in Facebook. Now, this one is very clear. We do know by recent research that males tend to be less likely on Instagram as they do females, right? And again, this is very like gender focused, you know, like it, it doesn't allow you for any other than other stuff. And this has to be pulled out of their, their um, um, profiles, right? Because Facebook and all, all social media pull all of your profile data, right? Um, but I think, you know, this is something to touch very carefully. I wouldn't say that you just look at this and assign that completely as part of what you do. Now, this is the same with Twitter. If you have a Twitter account, you should be able to do that. Um, you know, what are the trends? You could see a little more detail on the data of when you saw that it reached the most. So like for us, you know, if we look at that April 3rd was a really good day for us. If I go back and look at what April 3rd was in the week, most of our posting will come out there. Now we know that, you know, April 10th, Saturday, April 10th was when it worked best on Instagram, right? That's because we were having Saturday program and that post was about Saturday program. So the data makes sense. It's not just like fake data. It's not just like, oh, I don't know why. There is a relationship, but at least it allows you to understand that relationship, right? Because you're looking at data directly, right? Um, again, you know, here's the, 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 the audience data. It's a little more detail, you know, we have a number of students that participate from Cicero. So this makes sense. Um, we have students that participate in a program from Colombia. So that makes sense as well. 
uh, but that might not make sense is the New York, right? Or the Washington DC. It might be that someone in, in COE maybe saw it, right? Uh, I don't know, right? And so that might be those numbers. But if these numbers are really high and your community numbers are really low, then you need to look at who you're targeting, right? So at least it gives you some information on that. Um, again, Colombia, because it's one of our programs, it's involved here and that's why the percentage is low, but they're still engaging. So um, that gives you that information. Uh, let me present again. And so I'm just showing you here um, the rebrandly again, all the data that I showed earlier, but now you're looking at two sets, right? Like there is systems that we could use, right? Um, to do data gathering, right? Which is like spreadsheets and Google sheets and numbers without having a management system, right? I think uh, uh, COE could do better at presenting how to use a management system like Empower than I can, right? Um, uh, someone from Blue Man could do that better about their software than I can, right? Um, but I think looking at standalone systems, I will say that my preference is if you don't have a, a, the funds or the capacity to have a, a management system, a Google Sheet is a great way to manage student level data. Now, you still need to be very careful who has access. There has to be like, you know, approaches to um, making sure that, you know, whoever you give access that they log in with an account that it's blocked to specific people, that it's not a downloadable file. I mean, there's a number of things that you could actually set up. Um, Excel, unless you use your 360, you'll have it in a file that you need to start sharing with people. I wouldn't do that. I will have it on the 360 platform on the cloud so people could do it, especially right now that, you know, you can't just like have it in a computer and then the next person comes in and uses that computer because we're all remote, right? So I think, again, the, the, the pandemic has also put us in a place where we need to be more mindful of this other cloud systems that allow us to be mobile, right? Like not in the office, in front of your desk, in using a desktop that's just sitting there all the time that we actually move and transition. Um, so hopefully that makes sense um, in terms of like, this is where do you collect all the student data, um, activities with the students, all those kind of forms um, that collect, that connect to uh, your forms and your polls, right? Like all this data should be collected and shared within those spreadsheets, right? So you might have a master template where you say like, this is also content of our student profile when they engage on an activity. This is, you know, when we did a, um, a career uh, um, project or career exploration, this is students top three answers, right? And so then you could actually see that like if a student started with engineering the first um, uh, in middle school, but then all of a sudden by, uh, by high school is like, no, I am going to go into uh, language arts. Well, what happened through that process, right? Like what are the things that occur? Was it because they weren't doing so good at math? Did we support them on that or not? So, you know, I'm giving you the, the ends, but in between this data will help you support those students better, right? Because you are pulling the data from the polls, you're doing the, the, pulling, the pulling the data from forms, you know, from, from whatever form you use. And then just at the end of it all, right? You're having systems that pull analytics. So MailChimp, uh, your, your rebranding links, right? It sounds so simple. Just instead of giving the link that already you have, create a short link that it gets tracked, right? So simple, it takes like five minutes, right? But it's something that will allow us to understand much better who is using it, how many times are people using it? Are we sending it in the right format or not? Um, and again, you know, the, the MailChimp and then just making sure that your social media, if you're gonna use that as a tool of engagement, that you look at when is the best time to submit things, when is the most appropriate moment or what are the posts that are engaging the most that's why I put the post that you're seeing in the screen right now, because when we celebrated Women's History Month, you know, that post actually was the post that in that month or in the past, like three months had the most hits, right? And it was shared, I don't know, a number of times, right? Which is unheard of, right? It's not programmatic. It's not about students, you know, uh, signing up to an activity or, or visiting something or, 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 or information. It was just celebrating the staff. And so again, sometimes you need to look at that and maybe they needed some celebration at that moment, right? So maybe that is something that you need to look at. Um, so again, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I will at this point take questions. Did I hit it on time? Almost. Yes, you did. Right on time. Um, so it doesn't look like we had gotten any questions throughout the presentation. So if you do have questions now would be the time that you can ask. 
feel free to use the Q&A feature. We also can unmute them if they want to raise their hands. Yeah, that'll be great. So I see that Roy has his um, hand raised. So uh, let's answer Roy. Do you want to put um, uh, on mute Roy? Is that possible? Looks like um, Roy put his hand down. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, I saw a question in the chat box if Reblandly is free. Yes, it is. Um, so Reblandly, all you need to do is sign up um, with, the, with the login account. All you need is an email account and it will just create it. I have used it for about two years now, year and a half maybe, like very frequently. And our program now has moved from other short links to that short link. And this had to do also because Google stopped doing their Google short link. Like it's no longer existing, right? So that's what we had to move, right? So sometimes it's just, that's the way it happens, but we don't pay for it. Um, so hopefully that, um, that gives you an idea of that. And then so, and you could also share within a team. So it's, it's very much like Bitly. I think the, the data collection might be a little more robust. No, you cannot track. Uh, so the question is, can we track existing links? So if you already created a link and it went out, it's already out, get, get, like, you know, share. You can bring it back in and, and get the data that track that could be tracked out of that link that you share already. You have to have a new link that will be starting that whole data gathering because what it does is that link has some code embedded to track who's opening, who's clicking it, where is it going to, right? Most links should, but some service providers don't offer it without cost. Um, so hopefully that helps. And so for the other one, uh, Google Translate was found in the MailChimp, correct. So when I open MailChimp in, you know, in, a, um, in the view format, right? So if you see it here, um, if I click on view on browser, if I click on that one, then it opens up in a new page and it automatically attaches itself to the Google Translate. So it's not like you have to open it in Google Translate. It already automatically, once you click on view on browser, will give you that. And then that translate will just appear at the top. And then you could just go ahead and change it. Um, I think once you click on, on a specific language, it will also allow you to have more languages once you go to the main page. Um, so like if I put in Spanish, you know, again, it didn't detect the language. So, you know, I got to make sure that I share it to detect the language, right? And it should, I don't know why it's not doing it, but it should uh, pick up that the original language was English. But here now, if I want to go to two, you get a, a few more that in the actual original page. Um, so hopefully that helps. Johanny, um, yes, uh, you will be receiving the, the uh, recording of the webinar as well as the PowerPoint presentation. And the PowerPoint presentation is a PDF with all the links um, live. So you could just click on it and it should take you to it. No worries, Johanny. Anyone else? Anything that you would have thought that would have been interesting? And again, just because it's always good to know what could we have done. Is there an area of data collection that you might have, you might be interested on that might not have been touched? That has nothing to do with using the platforms like Blue Man and Empower and that, because I think that's a tool on its own. No. I'll give it another second in case there is something. Um, or a question that you might have about like data gathering that you might be just struggling with. We still have a few more minutes. Thank you, Lynette. And I haven't forgot, I think uh, uh, as a sign up for Lynette and I haven't got back to it and I should have, um, I did another presentation and, and for some reason I forgot to record because I was managing it myself. Um, and so, but I will make sure that I send you that, um, that presentation. I, 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 I wanna make sure I don't forget.
Um, so Andrea, uh, for the MailChimp, um, if you don't send, I mean, the good thing about MailChimp is that you could also ask it to send the messages in, in pieces, right? And so instead of like sending like 500 emails, it will send like 25, 25, 25, which is what a lot of companies do now. Because when you send mass emails, it gets whitelisted, right? And so like it removes you from, from, from participation and people, it goes to their spam or it just doesn't even arrive, right? So what you could do is ask MailChimp to send them in, in pieces. So send 10 or 15 at a time. And still like, you know, throughout like the, the, the next 10 minutes, even if it's a second difference, it's enough for it to, be, to get passed through. Um, oh, thank you, Leslie. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, uh, sometimes this sounds very difficult um, on, on thinking about like, how do we go and transition our current communication into a mass mailing, right? Or like, um, I think I always thought about it. How much time does it take me to do a, 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 a hard copy um, um, newsletter and then get it together, process it, and then when I want to redo it, right, like we have to recreate a lot of stuff. I think this type of campaign uh, uh, tools not only allow us to do a lot of like the editing very quickly, right, changing pictures, changing the text, um, but also just sending it out and even attaching time to it. So like one of the good things about um, the, the campaign uh, tool is that you could actually say when to send out. So it's not like when you finish, then you need to send it out. You could send it whenever you want to. Um, so I think that's also a good thing. And, and yeah, it might be, it might be a little bit uh, intimidating. I'm talking about data and analytics, um, but I think it's very important to just look at it and, and deal with it. Um, this is something that I, I forgot to share, but this is the, a data resource from an executive summary um, coming out of, um, sorry, uh, coming out of the data quality campaign. And it talks about data management for growth success of students. Um, I'll make sure that I send this link. Um, I completely forgot about it. I'm gonna just drop it into the chat box. Um, but as I was going through, um, can I put this into all attendees? Yeah. And so this link will take you to like, you know, uh, some information, some really information about like how to track growth um, on students, right? Especially if you want to see like their, their increase. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, Amanda, I'm sorry you already mentioned, but I struggle with getting signatures during webinars. I don't know how to obtain the proof. Okay, so a couple of things that could be helpful here. Um, and I'm not going to give you the, 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 the overall answer because there's so many approaches to this. But if you are doing a, a webinar, for example, like this one, I could actually download the attendee list, right? And so that's one way to say, well, unless you're logged in, right? And, and, and hopefully what you ask is that they use their name, right? Like so that they don't come out with a pseudonym, like spider monkey or something like that, right? Because students tend to have fun with those. So they'll put like a different name than the, their name. But you could ask in sessions that students put their first and last name in the Zoom meeting. And then that's one way. Another way is creating a Google form and then, or Jot form. Yes. So um, you could use a Jot form and actually just make that happen. And then they'll sign that up. And there's a number of tools, right? Um, we don't, we haven't been using job form for a while. We had some issues with, um, the data, like connecting correctly. Um, but we have forms like Google forms, um, that we just ask and the students just like, you know, initial them. Um, and there's also, uh, other ways to do it, but you know, that just, you know, if you just wanted to stick to like something as simple as downloading the, the, the list of participants and attendees, I think that's enough information to share hey, they logged in, I have a timestamp from the system. I can't fake the timestamp of the system, right? And if you do, if, if somebody on other tells you, oh, well, anybody could fake that, it's like, just tell them to do it for you. Because it takes a lot of time and effort to do that, right? It's not so simple. And just to say that three or four students showed up, I don't think anybody's going to go through the process of hacking Zoom to create that, right? So I think, you know, by having that download in the system of saying like timestamps of when the students sign up should give you enough to be like, this is enough, at least in the front end right now in virtual mode uh, for us to gather some information. Now, applications to release forms and all that, that's a whole different story, but attendance, I think you could go with that. So hopefully that helps. Excellent. Um, all right, it's 3.09. Um, we're like five minutes um, before it's gonna be over, um, but I could answer you know, one or two more questions if there is anything else.
Excellent. And I just put in my 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 contact information there, um, just in case, because I'm always like retweeting, reposting stuff that you know people do in the workload in their in their work life. So um, that's just a resource. I'm not promoting myself. I'm just saying, you know, if you want to, if you follow me, that's what I did. And I think a lot of the learning I have done, because I didn't go to school to know how to use marketing tools, right? Like that wasn't my degree, right? But what I did was I got into you know Twitter and I saw someone doing this and then I follow them. I listen what they did. I start using the tool and then all of a sudden we start using it in the program. So I think there is a lot to learn in, in Twitter because a lot of people, people put a lot of like very relevant content out there. So, you know, highly encourage you to spend a couple of time, a couple minutes a day in Twitter because you might get a lot of information there uh, to improve your program. Excellent. Well, I think that's it. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think Surema, you're on mute. Are you? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying perfect. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for our participants. So again, be on the lookout for the email that will uh, obtain the recording as well as the PDF of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Looks like you're the host, Erin. So